Hello everyone, welcome to the vapor portion of the 2021 WORF tutorial. In this tutorial, I'll be showing you how to use vapor. It'll be a very cursory look at the application, but the first question you may ask is what is vapor? Vapor is a 3D visualization application built for multiple platforms to be used on laptops, desktops, and supercomputers. It's open source, so all the code is there for you to take, use, or even contribute to if you want. It's cross-platform, so it works on OS X, Windows, Ubuntu, and CentOS. Below you can find links on where to download installers for Vapor, as well as links to our GitHub repository so you can see the code that's actually uh, behind the product. You can also find links to documentation and guides. Uh, and again, this is a cursory glimpse on how to use Vapor. There are, there are much more detailed guides in the links below in our documentation. But what's in this tutorial specifically? Number one, I'm going to cover Vapor's renderers. On the right, we can see two examples of renderings that come from Vapor. Vapor is comprised of a set of these tools that we call renderers, and each renderer depicts your data in a in a particular way uh, based on parameters of color and opacity. On the top, we see a volume rendering of, uh, that, that I think that is uh, re simulated reflectivity from a tornado simulation. And on the bottom, we see simulated smoke coming from the high resolution rapid refresh model, uh, also known as HER, coming from NOAA. Um, below the smoke, we also see an example of our image renderer, which can draw maps under your simulations as long as your data is georeferenced. And as long as you're a WORF user, you're probably in that ballpark. The second thing I'll talk about during this tutorial is how to use NCAR's visualization cluster called Casper. Casper is a adjacent system to Cheyenne, our, our supercompute cluster and uh, it has graphics cards in it, pretty much. So if you have a lot of data on NCAR's Glade file system, it makes a lot of sense to run your visualizations next to the data uh, versus downloading it onto a local machine. And so Casper is right next to Glade and it can render things much faster than if you had to download terabytes of data onto your local computer and then run Vapor from there. So I'll go through how to run Casper. And, and lastly, I'll go through uh, VDC data conversion. So one of Vapor's strong points is that it, um, it, it comes with a set of tools that allow you to convert your data into the VDC data format. And the benefit of the VDC data format is that it allows you to look at your data at different levels of compression. So if you're looking at a massive amount of data, if you're trying to volume render it, like so, say you're trying to look at the smoke field in the bottom right, this might take minutes, uh, ten, tens of minutes to render a single frame, which really inhibits uh, interactivity. You can't really play around with different parameters if it takes 10 minutes to change just one thing. So what VDC allows you to do is to look at your data at a compressed fidelity, and then once you think you have your color and opacity fields right, crank it back up for your final production. And so that'll be the last thing I cover. So all that being said, I'm gonna get started and exit out of my presentation, minimize my screen. And so I'm on OS X right now. In order to open Vapor, I have a, um, I guess, I guess I have a, a link at the, but just clicking on that after installing it opens up the application. So here we can see I've opened up Vapor. The first thing I will do is click on the file menu, go to my import screen, and the first file set, I know this is a WORF tutorial, and for WORF data sets, I would click on WORF ARW, but for one data set that I'm going to show, I'm going to click on uh, NetCDF CF. And that, that CF stands for CF compliant NetCDF data because NetCDF data can describe anything under the sun. Vapor supports a subset of it called CF compliant NetCDF data. 
So I'm going to go down to my, let's see, my data directory into my CF directory. And I'm going to import four files directly. And once I do that, immediately I see my data domain. My right mouse can zoom out my, uh, or in, depending on how I drag it. My left mouse rotates the scene, and my middle mouse button can transpose the scene. The first thing I want to do to show any data whatsoever is click on this button up here that says New. And this button shows all of the renderers that I have available to me. The first renderer I'm going to be showing is my volume renderer. So I will double click on that and then enable by clicking on this checkbox. And now we see our first volume rendering of our data. But what variable are we looking at? On the left, we can see in the variables tab, our variable name is dbz, so simulated reflectivity. And the color map variable is also dbz. So we're looking at pure dbz. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, it gets a little bit more complicated, but I'll get to that in another video. Um, if you look over here, we can see there's four tabs for the volume renderer. There's a variables tab. There's also the appearance tab, the geometry tab, and the annotation tab. The most important ones are probably the variables and appearance. Appearance is probably the most imp important one. So I'm going to click on appearance. And if you can see, this, this rendering is just the outer surface of the entire volume. We can't see into it at all. So what we have to do is apply opacity to some of the values in the data so that we can see through the volume. So over here I can see there's a lot of blue, there's not a lot of detail in uh, this section of the simulation. So in my appearance tab, in order to see through it, I look at my transfer function. The transfer function is basically a distribution of values of the data within the entire volume. So my data here goes from about negative 36 to about 75. And this graph shows the distribution of data values between those two extremes. The values are having colors applied to them based on this color bar that we see here on the bottom. So if I take this left control point and drag it to the right, we can see that everything becomes more blue. And then likewise, if I take the red one and bring it over, eventually everything will become red. By double clicking on the color bar, I can add a new control point and shift the, the white region of the color left and right. So that's, that's how color is applied pretty much. It's, it's this color bar applying its colors to the data values that are directly above it in this distribution function. Opacity is probably one of the more important things when it comes to volume rendering though, because again, we can't see through anything. So if I wanted to see through this blue region, I could take this black bar at the top grab a control point and drag it down. And now I can see through the blue. So basically what this bar is doing is that if, if it's lower on the y-axis, it um, applies transparency. So everything that's at zero on the y-axis right here has 100% transparency, but everything that's maximized on the y-axis has complete opacity. It's completely opaque and you can't see through it. So I can take these control points and select the data that I want to show. So if, let's say, if, if there's this, okay, if, this, if there's this mound right here, and for example, if we wanted to show only this, um, this distribution, We could do it by applying opacity 
to this distribution here and masking out everything else. And that would allow us to see through into our tornado or whatever uh, data set you have. So I should, I should, I should touch on um, a couple other things though. Um, so that's the appearance tab, the basics. The geometry tab allows us to control where we're rendering within the scene. So if I'm looking at the geometry tab, I can reduce the rendering on any axis as follows. So if there's a specific region that I only want to show, I can do that through the geometry tab. Additionally, if I click on this uh, region dropdown, I get a control box that lets me right click on these knobs and render different uh, regions of the domain without having to, um, I guess, use sliders. It's, it's more of a visual feedback system. So, moving on, the next renderer, which I think is the flagship renderer of Vapor, is the flow renderer. And if I move to, if I move too fast right there, let me, uh, I'll delete that renderer. I'll, I'll keep my volume renderer, but I'll click on new. I'll make a new flow renderer, and then right off the bat, I have a new flow renderer, and I will enable it. And so. The flow renderer allows us to draw path lines and streamlines. And so right now we're looking at streamlines that are based on the U, V, and W field of the tornado. And I'll keep my variables as, as is. I think most of the time U, V, and W are the, uh, the vectors that are used for streamline advection. Um, the next tab I'll move over to is the seeding tab where we can dictate whether or not we're using streamlines or path lines. For this cursory uh, example, I'll just use streamlines. But path lines are different uh, than streamlines. So streamlines are static in time. So if you're going to look at one time step and just look at where the vectors go, you'd use streamlines for that. But path lines can be advected through time. and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's another tutorial that I'll have a link to at the bottom. Um, gosh, which, what do I want to go through here? So right now we can go through our seed distribution settings. We have X, Y, and Z seed distribution, and it's probably hard to tell, but we have a 5 by 5 grid uh, by 1 on our X, Y, and Z axes. What is not, yeah, what I'd like to change here is where the seeds are being distributed. So, okay, right there, that's our, that's our geometry selector. What I think I'd like to do is reduce our rake region. So down here we have a rake region selector, which determines how the seeds are distributed. So if I shrink this down to the bottom on the Z axis, okay, now, now our rake, region is the full domain on X and Y, but on Z, it's been shrunk all the way down. I can hone in on it also by clicking on these uh, control handles and then nudge my seed distribution closer to the tornado. Whoops, I'll control Z to undo that. And so there, there's a demonstration of how we can control where our seeds are being placed within our domain. Yeah, it's, it's tricky how deep I wanna go here with all the features. Um, but I'm going to move on to the Appearance tab because the, the Flow Renderer also has a transfer function associated with it. And so we can apply different color palettes 
uh, again, like with the volume renderer, we can drag our control points left and right to control how the color is applied to these streamlines. Um, one thing I'll touch on real quick is uh, there are different color palettes that we can select. So by clicking on this uh, gearbox, we can load a built-in color map, and then we have a whole set of uh, different color maps that I'll have another talk on, I'm sure, coming up soon. But if I click on this sequential color map, I can click on black body, and I think that's uh, the color map that I was using on my presentation slides. Again, here's the geometry tab where we can clip the data that we're sampling. And so that's, yeah, I, I, I want to go deeper into the flow renderer, but I have to move on. Uh, again, there's more links to more tutorials below. Uh, that will do much more of a deep dive into uh, into these renderers. But that's the flow renderer. Um, next, I believe I have the ISO surface renderer. And so the ISO surface renderer works in a very similar way to the volume renderer. Um, I've created a new ISO surface renderer through the new menu, and then I will enable it. But the ISO surface renderer's um, transfer function in the appearance tab, it, it doesn't have a color bar associated with it necessarily. Instead, it has this one control knob that allows us to select a single value upon which we draw a surface. A double click will enable a second ISO surface. Oh, and we can see my computer is starting to get bogged down which is one argument for the VDC data format. If you can look at data at a compressed rate, you can explore it without latency. But essentially all renderers work in somewhat the same way. You go to the variables tab and you pick your variable. Here we have DBZ. You go to your appearance tab and you play with the transfer function, which shows your data distribution, how color is applied to it, or in this case with the isosurface renderer, what data value the surface is being drawn at. The geometry tab, which lets you select the region you're drawing to. For example, I can restrict a region as such. It's not really for any practical purpose other than, yeah, it's just, just a demonstration. But sometimes um, you can be short on memory and you want to constrain the data that you're uh, bringing onto, uh, on, onto your memory. But yeah, I hope, I hope all that makes sense. Um, those are the basic tabs. I guess, I guess finally there's the annotation tab and so I can speak on that briefly, I'll re-enable my volume renderer. So here we are back in our volume rendering. I can go to the annotation tab, enable it, and now I have a color annotation that goes along with the volume rendering that I'm making. All right. Next, I think what I'm going to try to do, and we'll see how it goes, is close out. Of, and I'm going to show you guys how to log into Casper. Casper, again, is NCAR's um, visualization cluster. So first thing I want to do is, well, let's see.
I will log into Cheyenne and I will provide my token to Cheyenne and wait for Duo, the um, dual authentication application that NCAR uses to send my smartphone a you know heads up are you trying to log in and I'll say yes and so now here I am on Casper the next thing I will do is issue this command VNC server submit along with these arguments um, the big, the most important one is uh, dash A for your project name. So if you're an NCAR user, you'll have to provide your project name and um, yeah, this this will let's see. Still going. Okay, and here we go. I've issued my VNC server submit command with my project code, the screen geometry, which doesn't matter, you can resize the screen, the wall clock time, and my memory. Okay, so my batch job or my my interactive job on Casper has now been submitted. The next thing I will do is copy this line of code or this command to initiate a tunnel to Casper, which is done for security reasons. So in a new ter uh, terminal or console window, I will issue that command and re-enter my token response reconfirm with duo on my smartphone and now I will be issued a one-time password I will copy that password and then open turbo V and C which I'll have a link to below uh, if you guys need to download turbo V and C if you need uh, to use Casper either turbo V and C or tiger V and C are your options I will connect. Oops. There we go. And once I've entered my one time password, here I am on Casper. In order to use Vapor, I will open up my terminal. And uh, since Casper uses CentOS, um, well, by default, there are no application icons that you can just double click on. And so I open up my console and I type the command module load vapor and that loads the most recent version of vapor. From there, I will type vapor to open vapor and then 
I will point, well, let's just, let's just open Vapor and I can load the data manually. So I can import WORF, and then I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to point to a Katrina data set. Let's see, Glade. Oops. Vapor. Data. BDC. P3R. Worf. And then I will load my Katrina data files. So the next renderer I'll demonstrate is the image renderer, which I think is of high interest to a lot of WORF users. We're looking at a, a new data set here, Katrina. And so I'll click on my new button and then click on image. And then right off the bat, I'll go ahead and enable it. So right now we can see an image of um, what is called natural earth. It's, it's one of our images that we can, uh, that we bundle with vapor and that you can just draw a simple map with. Um, the variables tab isn't as important with the image renderer as it is with other data sets. But one thing you can do with the variables tab is apply a height variable, and this is a bad data set to show it with, but I can select HGT in this WORF simulation, and you can barely see, yeah, you can't even really see it, we're looking at Florida right now. So the height variable is like pretty much non-effective, but if you were looking at mountainous terrain, the uh, image would be offset by the height variable. And you know what, I can even go, let me go to my navigation tab. I can go to my viewpoint. Uh, is it the viewpoint or is it the settings tab? Uh, well, I won't worry about it too much right now. The main point is that you can get a map into your uh, visualization very easily by just creating a new image renderer. In the Appearance tab, there are several options. Um, my first option that I always go to is, is the image file. I, I prefer Big Blue Marble. Um, so if I click on a new image, I can click on, select uh, bigbluemarble.tms, open that. And there we go, there's big blue marble. Um, one thing you can also do is turn off the option to ignore transparency. So if you want sea floors, you can get them. Um, of course, we want a geo reference. And then there's the level of detail for the image. Um, Vapor tries to pick a smart default level of detail because these are, this is like the, it's using a similar, uh, algorithm that Google Maps uses so that if you zoom out far enough, you're not going to load a massive image. But if 
for any reason, if, if you don't think the level of detail of the image is good enough, like right here, you can crank it up to four. Let's see. Looks like that is the maximum level of detail that we have. But there's other uh, images that you can download that allow even finer grained resolution. So I'm going to move on to the contour renderer. So now that we have our image, I'll cl click on new, click on contour. And here we have our contour renderer. I'm just going to fire it off, turn it on, and let's turn off our image renderer so we can see what we got here. So the contour renderer is one of Vapor's two-dimensional uh, data renderers. And it basically draws a contour on your selected variable. So if I select on my contour renderer up here, we can pick on uh, whatever variable we want. Let's see. V10 is always good for a hurricane data set. And then if we go over to the Appearance tab, we can adjust the contour values in a similar way that we can do with our isosurface renderer. And of course, the color is apl applied in the same way that we saw earlier with our volume renderer. Geometry works in the exact same way. I can segment it if I want. So moving on, I guess the last renderer I'd like to show is the barb renderer. So barbs or wind barbs are pretty much arrows that are drawn along a, 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 a vector. That's a 3D renderer as well. It, it can be, I guess. And um, you can you can select your X, Y, and Z vector fields under the appearance tab. You can determine how many barbs you want to draw on X, Y, and Z. And shoot, I am I am nearly out of time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put a stop right here, but guys, there's gonna be more tutorials, more information. There's a lot more I'd love to cover with uh, Vapor, but for the Wharf tutorial, um, Please reach out to us on our Discord forum. We have uh, links below. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help. All right. Thank you for your time.